Hi, this is Straight Up Mortgage with Madi, and today I wanted to address a question that I get frequently. Um, I created this channel basically for people that are new processors, not really thinking about, um, I guess, those that may have heard of the position and not exactly know or understand what the position is and you know what we do as mortgage processors so i created this video i have zizi here assisting me um basically just to explain or an outline what it is a mortgage processor does what you can expect from uh this position so i'll just start from the top i don't have any notes i am really just going to you know do it off the top of my head so hopefully this comes out right as far as organization goes but um i'm just going to give an example let's say you're purchasing a house you're purchasing a house the first thing you want to do is maybe figure out how much money um you know you can afford or how much house you can afford so you may want to contact a mortgage company and uh, the mortgage company will have their salesperson or their loan officer, also known as a loan origination, um, a, a loan originator, or uh, they have a lot of different names from that for them. But the more popular ones is a loan officer, a loan originator, uh, and this is a sales position. They'll talk to you and basically find a mortgage program that best suits you whether it's a government loan, FHA, VA, a conventional loan. Um, you know, they'll take an application from you. They'll do a little income calculation, just a, a rough income calculation to figure out how much it is that you're making, uh, therefore how much you can qualify for. And you may or may not be able to obtain what is known as a pre-approval from this loan originator and um, at that point, you would go and you would go to your realtor. You guys will go look for houses. Fast forward and let's just say that you found a house, right? So you found a house and now it's time to really get your application rolling with your uh, mortgage company, right? So what you're going to do, excuse me, is um, you'll have to gather some documents. Uh, your your pay stubs, maybe some W-2s. Your loan originator would have gotten your credit report pulled. Um, the processor is going to look at all of these documents. They'll look at your credit report. They will look at your income documents. They'll look at your asset documents, so bank statements, things of that nature. Um, you might have to you know, upload your ID and things like that. The processor will look at that. And ultimately, that processor is going to review the application. So the main part of or the main point of the mortgage processor is to take the file from the LO and see it to the finish. So that processor is going to review each part of the load the application. Um, you know, they're going to make sure that we have two years residence history listed. So if your borrower, uh, maybe they filled out the application and they only have one year listed. The processor needs to make sure there's two years. So the processor may reach out to the LO or to the borrower to make sure that we have that information. We also need to have two years of um, employment history. So let's say if the borrower uh, worked at their current position for less than two years, then we would need the previous employer to be listed as well. The processor is going to ensure that that aspect of the, um, the application is complete. They are also going to make sure that the credit liabilities, so the trade lines that are listed on uh, the credit report, that they are accurately, accurately, excuse me, being accounted for on that loan application. Now, on my channel, I have a, a video about DTI and the LTV, so I'm not going to talk too much about that here. But basically, we want to make sure that the liabilities or the debt that the borrower has um, is being accounted for on the application because it's going to affect that DTI or debt to income ratio. And if your DTI is too high, then you may not qualify for a specific loan. 
So we want to make sure that our LOs are actually inputting all of the debt that our borrowers have. And sometimes there's debt like that's not on the credit report. So, you know, maybe child support, maybe they could be having garnishments from their check due to, I don't know, student loans, child support, things of that nature, uh, 401k loans. Uh, these are all debts that need to be accounted for to make sure that we have an accurate DTI. So the processor is making sure that the DTI is accurate by both checking and um, analyzing, finalizing the debt, but then also properly calculating the income. Sometimes, you know, maybe the borrower has a salary position, we calculated that income and the loan works. But then the processor found that this borrower is also paying child support and the LO didn't know that. So this is another debt that needs to be added to the application. So let's say in that case, you know, um, now the DTI is too high, but maybe we can ask the borrower, maybe the borrower has another stream of income. Um, you know, maybe one person, I know I just said that they could be paying child support, but what if it was a 401k loan? Um, and that borrower has to pay on that 401k loan. So that's the debt, but maybe the borrower might be receiving alimony. So that's another income that could be added to the application. So now that application works again. So I'm not going to go too much into, you know, how to fix a loan or structuring or restructuring loans. However, I do want you to have an understanding that this position does require a certain level of understanding um, as far as the processor is concerned. Um, and there's a, a level of work and energy that goes into this position as well. Um, so, you know, we talked about income. We talked about credit. Now for assets. If the borrower has to bring money to closing, so let's say if they this is a purchase or um, even for some refinances, as long as it's not a cash out refinance or even a rate and term refinance where the borrower is getting some money back at the closing table, uh, we would require to see uh, bank statements. There's also some other things, some other guidelines, but I'm not going to talk too much about guidelines on this video. Um, but yeah, so if the borrower has to bring money to the closing table, we need bank statements to see where this money is coming from. So the processor would need to ensure that we have those bank statements on file. If the borrower says that they have, you know, maybe, I don't know, $10,000 in their TD bank account, then we need to ensure that we have at least 30 days um, bank statements reporting that income. And then the processor also would need to update the application to match what's listed on that bank statement. Um, the processor should also review the bank statement, you know, just to make sure that there's any, there isn't anything that looks off or um, ensuring that the bank statement is, um, actually belongs to our borrower. Sometimes, there might be a joint account and we might need an access letter. So we're reviewing the bank statements. We see that the borrower shares this particular account with, I don't know, maybe their mother. So now we need a letter from the mother basically stating that the borrower has 100% access to those funds. Um, just other little things that a processor should review to ensure that the bank statements are good to go to underwriting. Um, if the borrower owns any other properties, those properties need to be disclosed and listed on the application. Um, so we talked about, you know, the residence history. We talked about the employment history, uh, calculation of income, making sure the assets are there. There also, uh, we also talked about the REO or the real estate owned that they have. Those are um, some of the things that they're looking at. And then at the end, there's like a declarations page where the borrower has to answer like a set of questions. And it's mostly in regards to like litigation and um, things of that nature, whether they own property in the past, um, bankruptcy. So questions of that nature where the processor would need to review and make sure that they're answered and answered in a way that we can actually proceed with the application. Um, and then that processor is going to run what is called AUS. 
AUS stands for Automated Underwriting System. And this system is basically going to look at the software, um, read the software, AKA read your application that is inputted in this software. <clears throat> so they're going to read the information that is listed on your application that you input it and they're going to give you a rating or they're going to give you what is called a finding. There's two AUS systems. Um, we utilize DU, which is desktop underwriter. This is from Fannie Mae and we utilize LP, LPA, uh, Loan Prospect Advisor. And this is Freddie Mac's AUS system. We run the AUS, AUS will give us findings. And these findings are basically going to give us um they're going to let us know whether or not uh they feel that this is a good loan ultimately underwriting tells us yay or nay however these aus findings they do guide us and let us know you know whether we need more documentation whether we need less documentation um there's some files that'll you might need an appraisal. There's other files where you don't need an appraisal. So it just really depends. And these are things that I go into depth with within my channel, but also within my e-course. But I did want to give a rough analysis as to what to expect as a mortgage processor. So now after the processor does all of these things up front, they submit the file to the underwriter. The underwriter will now say, okay, I like this file or I do not like this file. In the event the underwriter says, I like this file, however, I need X, Y, and Z. This is called your conditional loan approval. So now the processor is going to review this conditional loan approval and they will see what is needed from them and the, and the borrower. There's borrower conditions and processor conditions. An example of a borrower condition could be that we need an updated pay stub or that we need an additional bank statement from the borrower. Um, there's other things that the, that the underwriter could ask for, but I'm just going to give those high level examples. Um, processor conditions. An example of that could be tax transcripts where the processor would need to order tax transcripts or um, let's say a verification of employment. The processor may need to reach out to the borrower's employer and um, ask them for a breakdown of how that borrower is paid. And that's something that's on the head of the processor. So now it's the job of the processor to go through this conditional loan approval and pinpoint which conditions are for the borrower and which conditions are for the processor. Now let's say, you know, in a perfect world, the processor obtained all of the borrower conditions and um, obtained all of the processor conditions. And now the loan is being resubmitted back to the underwriter. And the underwriter looks at everything and says, okay, this is all I need. This file is clear to close. So now the file will go to the closing department and some other things go on in the background and the file is done. And the processor would then have to do the same thing again with more files. Now, um, you don't do one file at a time. You know, most pop processors will have a pipeline of between 20 and 60 loans. So it just really depends. The role of a processor is not a part-time position. Um, I, I've never seen a part-time processor and that's just because it's not the nature of the business. Now, if you started your own processing company, then you can kind of regulate how much uh, or how many loans you're processing. And for anyone that does want to do that, it's a very lucrative thing. However, I would say if you've never processed a mortgage before to first work with a, a company and, you know, once you get your footing and get some experience, then go the route of actually starting a processing um, company. But yeah, so uh, the role of the processor is number one about customer service, because in order for us to get more loans, we need to make our customers happy. So it's about following up. It's about reaching out to your borrower, keeping them in the loop. Um, I'd say that's number one. Number two is organization. Um, you know, because you have to keep track of these loans. You have to know your closing dates. You have to know your rate lock expiration dates. 
Um, I know some of the stuff is going over your head, but you can understand the concept of a closing date, right? So if you're purchasing a house and you make an offer to the person um, in which you're purchasing the house from, let's say the contract will say the closing date is January the 5th. So the processor needs to make sure that that loan, that file is ready to go by January the 5th. So you have to get on top of it. And sometimes you're ordering things and you're not getting them right back. So your job is just to order it. Your job is to obtain it. So if you order something and someone tells you that they're going to get it to you um, and they don't send it back, it's your job to follow up. It's not going to be on a title company for not sending it to you. It's going to be on you because you didn't follow up and it's your document that you need. So it's a game of following up. So number one is customer service. Number two is organization. And then number three is following up because you have to follow up with everyone. You might have to follow up with the borrower. You have to follow up with maybe even your loan originator, follow up with the underwriter. And these are all in, these people are internal. And then there's external people, other companies, third party services and vendors that you may need to order things from and then follow up with. So you have to have a strong <laughs> follow up game um, as a mortgage processor. Um, also, I do my best to not give anybody any stories as far as stress is concerned. This is a stressful industry, straight up. It's a stressful industry. Um, I always tell like my students that being a processor should not be the end all be all. Be all. I know there's some people that just love it and maybe that'll be you, maybe that is you and that's great. But most people do not love it. And um, so I feel like you should get in there, gain the experience, gain the exposure, gain the knowledge because it's a very lucrative industry. It's a very, uh, just the real estate industry as a whole is, is a money industry. So if you understand the financing side of it, then you can do good things. You can do big things in the industry. You can become an underwriter. You could become a loan originator. You can do, go the entrepreneurial route and become a, um, a uh, third party processor or independent processor. Um, you know, you can become a real estate investor. You can do a lot of different things. Um, and having this knowledge of how to obtain financing and what it takes to get financing would definitely, you know, put you ahead of the game. So that's, you know, just some advice for me. But just even just with being a processor, it's a lucrative position. Um, I'd say anywhere between... 35 and 80k depending upon where you're located and depending upon your um your level of experience is you know that's average there's processors that are making you know six figures as well so it just depends upon where you're at and then also your uh your zeal and your willingness to to learn because you're forever learning in this position so I hope that this video was uh, informative for you. I kind of ran through that. And um, so I hope it makes sense. Let me know down in the comments and I'll see you on the next video.